You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. If you'd like to learn more about the Bearded Theologians, you can go online at beardedtheologians.com, where we have past podcasts, blogs, and a couple items for sale. So check us out, beardedtheologians.com. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this week's show. As Zach's passing air, I'd like to prepare you for the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. So uh, this week on the podcast, we're picking back up with our um, Don't Put Discipleship uh, in the Corner series that we have. And uh, um, we're looking at the question that we kicked out is, um, what can discipleship look like? Um, Zach, as you think about that, and as you think about us trying to really emphasize the importance of discipleship making, um, what are some things that come to mind for you? Well, I, I think for me, what can discipleship look like is such a broad and open-ended question that I think we try to put uh, constantly in a box that may or may not work. <laughs> I think I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked a little bit about um, you know, discipleship pathways and, and some things like that. And what I have found in, in the idea of discipleship pathways is they're, they all, they always point back to one place that discipleship points back to one place. And there's often in, and if you see a diagram or you see a model of a discipleship pathway, it's linear, or even if it's, uh, even if it's a circle or some kind of figure eight, there's only one entry point. Um, and if you make an argument for multiple entry points, you know, it, it gets muddy. <laughs> People don't like that, uh, in my experience. And then it almost always points to worship, um, that you enter the church somewhere along the way and you end up in the sanctuary on Sundays and worship, like all of these discipleship pathways, whether it be missions or ministry or youth youth or college or a book study or whatever it is, they all point back to Sunday morning worship of some rate. And I think this whole idea of we don't put discipleship in the corner, for me, pushes back on that idea that not everything has to point to worship on Sunday, that the discipleship is so much bigger than that. Not to say that worship, worship is obviously important, but if we begin to look at it, the end all be all, I think we do the very thing we're talking about. We put discipleship in a corner. We put it in a box that is so restricted that that we have a hard time looking beyond that. And I think that's the struggle that we see in the church with discipleship is um, it's pretty flat and pretty linear. And, uh, you know, anytime we just try to think outside of the box as leaders, as pastors, as, as lay people doing things. We either get pushed back and say, no, that won't work, or it can't work, or you can't do that because it doesn't point, you know, it doesn't bring people into the sanctuary. Um, and yet, you know, Matt and I are here asking the question, what does that look like? What can discipleship look like? And um, I think, it, you know, the sky's the limit, right? <laughs> Which is a really scary thing because then that's hard to hard to grab onto. Um, and so that's kind of my, that's my introductory thoughts on what discipleship looks like or really doesn't look like, I guess, is, is my answer to the question. Um, because I think there's so much more than we give it credit for, for being. Well, wouldn't you say that the goal of discipleship making is really um, making, helping people be more like Jesus. And so if um, this, if, you know, like we talk about here, um, we, you know, we strive uh, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Um, and so everything we do ask that question, is this making disciples of Jesus Christ or are we making disciples of X, Y, Z person or pastor or whatever, you know, whatever it is, are we making that the golden calf or are, you know, um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's like, if you're going to start somewhere, if you're, if your church doesn't have a process or it doesn't have, um, even the idea of discipleship making, like, what does that look like? Um, you know, people are attracted to that. I was reading an article this, um, um, from, I think it was Tom Rainer that talked about that, that people are looking for that kind of a process. Mm -hmm. Um, but the process, this is, these are my words, not Rainer's, but just that whole idea of the, the article, 
but the idea of the process really should um, create people that look and act and live like Jesus, not do they look and act like pastor or Sunday school class or, and I think you're right too, Zach, on the multiple entry points um, that we have to acknowledge that um, especially in this day and age with uh, digital uh, as it is, and the now many, many avenues of, of connecting into the life of the church, that um, we have to acknowledge that there's more uh, than one journey towards being like Jesus, and it's not all worship-centric. Worship is key. Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong. Like I think mm-hmm. that that's a vital part of living out your faith as a follower of Jesus. Right. Agreed. However... I think you also need to have the others too, to have that balance that we should have in our discipleship. Right. And, and I think that's the argument at argument I would make in that whole idea of, of the process, right. Of any kind of discipleship process is that worship is part of it, but it can't be the end all be all right. It can't be the ending point. It can be an entry point for some folks, or it may not be in people's thing, right. They may find community, um, in a worship service that's outside of the sanctuary on Sunday morning, right? So there's, you're, you're absolutely right, especially in the world that we live in today. There's multiple entry points, there's multiple exit points, there's multiple ways that we can engage um, in meaningful worship and meaningful community and a meaningful discipleship. And I think we've just barely scratched the surface on it. Uh, and, and there's some things that we've done that work, right? And that continue to work let's not let those go. Um, but let us hear, let's hear our communities in, in what works for them. Right. Uh, I think, I think that's the thing I, I see us getting stuck in a lot of the time is, um, we try to try to shove a, you know, square peg into a round hole, right. Of this used to work, you know, it used to work for people, this discipleship thing, um, work for folks and we try to push it on folks and it's, it doesn't connect. It doesn't work. And yet we just keep trying to shove it, <laughs> just to keep trying to make it work. And instead of thinking of how, well, what does the community want, right? What do, what's connecting with the people? Well, and I think that that's where having, you know, having, you know, even a journey, discipleship journey, mm-hmm. like, what does that look like, you know? And, and having that, that question and, and, and being able to have people like every, I think, I think it, when you do the covenant, re, if you're Methodist and you do the covenant renewal service, you should have a document that people can sit with and ask mm-hmm. themselves, how was I faithful in these aspects, whatever you feel your congregation's vital parts of your ministry are, you know, how are, how are they living into that here at Tahlequah? You know, we live in the model of connecting, serving, and growing. And so we ask ourselves, how are you connecting in? Where are you connecting in? How are you serving? And how are you growing? And, and look at those ways. And, 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 and if you're not happy in one avenue, what can you do to make better connections, to, to grow more, to serve more? Like, and those avenues are there. Um, and, and we can point people in those directions, uh, in those spaces. But we wouldn't have been able to do that had we not had those, those what I call like entry points, those base points of knowing when they hear me say, you know, um, here at Tahlequah United Methodist Church, we strive to be a church of open hearts, open minds, and open doors as we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of ourselves and of the world. And we do that by connecting, serving, and growing. Right. And, well, and, and I like that idea of journey, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that completely reframes the conversation of what we when we ask what can discipleship look like, if we look like if we look at it as a pathway or some, you know, something that's programmatic or you know functional, we we fall into that linear, very flat aspect of it. But when we begin to look at it as a journey, discipleship is a journey, just as our our lives are, right? Our spiritual lives are are, are journeys. Um, and Wesley was big on that. It's not a moment, it's not a point in time, but it's the fullness of of our life. And uh, why can't, why don't we look at discipleship as the same way, right? That it has seasons, it has ebbs and flows. It's this fullness of a journey that brings us closer to, closer to God each and every day. And they may look different down the road, you know, and, and being open to that. And I see a lot of people get frustrated in, you know, I, I did this in the past and it worked and I felt connected, but now I'm doing it. And I don't, I, I don't hear God anymore. Okay. Um, great, let's try something new, right? Uh, everything, I, I believe everything has a season in that journey. And, you know, 
let us be open to hearing and seeing what what our growing edge is, right? What's where God's speaking to us today. Um, and I think that's, I like that discipleship as a journey, I think is a, a good way to frame, to frame it and to frame the question. Well, and it's because we ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, let's, uh, we as clergy even, you know, I, yeah, I, I'm absolutely. thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm about to turn 40 years old. I've been doing this for over 20 years now. Um, and working in a church in some way, shape or form in the last 20 mm-hmm. years, not that I've been a clergy person for 20 years, but cause I think I'd look older and have way less hair on the top of my head, but um, but I do know that in my 20 years, I think one of the things I've discovered is um, that people are looking for ways to be connected into the growing and being like Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that, um, there are some ways that are, that are amazing and work um, very well. And then there are some that it's time for us to let go of. Right. Um, you know, if things are dying or, you know, like, can we not, can we please, 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 please be more attentive to the Holy Spirit? Like, like, please, like, I know, um, I think if anything frustrates me in the church right now, it's the, our lack of listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, and that, and, and when we feel that Holy Spirit and that presence in the place, whatever it is we're doing, you know, like, let's acknowledge it, let's live into it. But when it's not there, can we, can we say that maybe it's not this, it's, the season has passed and it's time for, for new things. Um, I, I think we don't do a good job of ending ministries. We do an amazing job of starting ministries. I, that's not, I don't think that's the church's problem. I think the problem is, um, <laughs> I always think of it like this. We're in the ninth inning and the, the starter has thrown 150 pitches and it's time for him to go and he refuses to go. He's going to throw 151. Mm-hmm. That's when the home run happens and they lose the game. Right. I, I really feel like that that's in a lot of our churches. That's where we're at. It's right. time for us to pull the pitcher and regardless of how he feels, you know, he doesn't have any more gas because he's given all these done, well done and good and faithful servant. It's time to rest and move into a new chapter. We have to do a better job of that. We do. And, and I th- maybe it's just human nature, right? Because I think we fall into it quite a bit of <laughs> or, or spiritual arrogance. I don't, I don't really know. Um, maybe I do know, right? <laughs> uh, but we have a bad habit in the church of inviting the Holy spirit in and, and believing we have that authority and not realizing the Holy spirit's already there calling us out, right. Calling us to move, calling us to shake, calling us to be out into this world. And we're left wherever we are going, be here, Holy spirit, be here. And the Holy spirit's going, I was there and now I'm over here. Come with me. You know, I'm, I'm leading you out into the world. I'm leading you into where the work is already happening. Join me. And I think we get, I think we get lost in some of that, in the idea that if we don't invite the Holy Spirit in, well, it's not, Holy Spirit's not going to be there, right? Or, you know, uh, it was here once, (laughs) and yet the Holy Spirit is actively calling us, and we're not, we're not hearing. Just like you said, it's that ebb and flow and that, hey, this ministry, this uh, thing that we were doing served its purpose. It did well, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Like you said, now here's the next one, you know, we're holding on, uh, we're holding on to what was. And I think that that's the, um, it's a struggle we all wrestle with, uh, even mm-hmm. us as, you know, well-seasoned clergy or, you know, you know, people that have been in appointments for a while, you know, there comes a time and space where maybe we do need to move into a new direction. And what does that look like? What leadership do we need? What, mm-hmm. how can we onboard new leadership? How can we, you know, um, help other re- leadership retire or move into new chapters in their life? And um, I, I think we struggle with that. And I think that's one of the reasons why the church does struggle on and the sense of discipleship making and what could look like that would be, and I think this is, this is the key. And this is something we're trying to implement here is utilizing what's known as an object-based job description. Mm-hmm. Of course, we call it object ministry description. Mm-hmm. And we have expectations and we have you know benchmarks that we want. And this is an agreed upon benchmark. It doesn't come from me. It comes upon right. working with the leadership, uh, whoever's in charge and, and saying, here's what we want to do in the next six months. And are we doing it? Are we meeting our goals? And if we don't meet our goals, maybe it's time to reevaluate this ministry. Right. And we and what we're, we've been able to implement that, um, we have seen success in them doing new things or even saying, you know, we used to do this and we don't want to do it anymore. We don't want it to be a part of our objective. And I think that Mm -hmm. that's having that space to do that, I think creates 
that opportunity for new things to happen, uh, creativity to happen. And I think it invites the Holy Spirit in, in, in a way that we really need uh, desperately, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Well, and we, we talked a lot about that two years ago at the beginning of COVID. And we have this opportunity as, as things have slowed down uh, forcefully. And how can we let go and grieve the ministries that we need to let go and grieve um, and spend our time and energy as things ramp back up to uh, either revitalize the ones that we truly do miss and that were vital, uh, grieve the ones that we know, um, you know, COVID killed, right? Or they were dead before, but COVID let us later rest. And how does that lead us into the new opportunities and the new creativity, right? Uh, rather than the um, the easy push to go back to normal, the way we did it before, Um and, and and like you said, how do we just let that be and, and tap into that and hear and, and learn, serve, and grow, whatever you guys do there? <laughs> well, and, you know, it's been different everywhere. Um, right. I, I've always tried to lay that groundwork that yeah. we have this mission. So here's our vision. Here's how we operate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then asking every ministry team, what are you going to do about that? Like, what's your right. plan? Right. Um, and I think that that's vital. I think far too often uh, ministry teams aren't equipped to do that kind of work. Uh, and that's the most important work. That's the most important work you can do. Uh, so that way you can have a space mm-hmm. um, uh, for growth, but also a space to acknowledge when something's not working and you need to take that time. And I just don't think we do in the church. And I think that that's been you know, we talk about, you know, that's how you put discipleship making in the corner. You don't hold it accountable. Right. Um, and I think that that's to me, like, what can it look like holding things accountable? Um, be willing to let go of things that need to be let go of mm-hmm. celebrate that loss, but then look forward to the future of what can be and what may grow out of what has been let go of. Right. Right. Yeah. I think it's, it's life cycle, Right. And in, in looking at the things we do uh, in, the, in the name or in the nature of discipleship and listening to the Holy Spirit, just as that, as a journey, as a life cycle, and um, that knowing, stepping into it, um, they may or may not be lifelong practices and disciplines and things that are life-giving forever, and that's okay. Um, you know, the more that we can take it a day at a time or a season at a time, and hold it accountable and just evaluating it, looking at it. How does it make a, you know, are we still connecting with this piece or not? And then doing the hard work to, like you say, grieve, to celebrate and to, to continue moving. And I think that that's, that's vital. It is vital. Um, and, and that's how we, I, I think that that's what it can look like mm-hmm. uh, as, we've, if we, as we think about that. Right. So I want to encourage you, um, to go to our website at beardedtheologians.com and listen to the first uh, part of this, um, which happened two weeks ago. Um, we had a, a week in between because we'd had the scheduled guest and uh, encourage it. Kara's book's amazing. If you haven't, um, if you need a Lenten study, you have a few more weeks before Lent starts. This would be a good thing to pick up because it has everything. If you're a pastor that's looking for liturgies and things like that, this has everything for you. No, Kara is not paying me to say this. Um, I mean, she did give me a book, so I guess it would be a way of payment. Share, share the title of the book. Uh, the title of the book is the, um, I misplaced my book. I had it oh, right here. Uh, you'll be able to find it next week's, last week's podcast. I can't think of it on top of my head. This is embarrassing. Um, uh, let's see. I can pull it up. A Time to Grow, Lenten Seasons for the Garden, From the Garden to the Table by Kara Edson. Yes. Uh, I apologize, Kara, for, for muffing that. Uh, I, I literally had it on my desk, but I guess I took it home to Ashley uh, for her to utilize. Um, so, you know, we want to encourage you to just check us out. Um, you know, comment, share us. Um, please do that. That's how we get, um, you know, it's how people get to know us and we can uh, continue to grow and continue to do things uh, um, and that are just fun. Um, and so for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Matt Franks. Uh, I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. Guys, I want you to subscribe and like this video. And put that thumbs, push that thumbs up.
Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.